let's just start with where were you born? How are you? How did you grow up? Well, no, let's start with your name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who are what's, you? What's name, your name? Maybe birthday. Just things like yeah. that. Go ahead, Sister James. Well, my name is Vera. I don't like the sister, but um, <laughs> you can call me if you want to, Vera. And I was born in California. Yuck. But I didn't live there. Um, my folks moved. My dad lived in Idaho, so they moved to Idaho. Um, most of my growing We're at up. Idaho. Well, let's see. It started out at um, Du Bois. Du Bois. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And then they moved to Jerome. You guys have heard of Jerome, right? And then they got divorced, and Mom moved to Twin, and Mom remarried, and then we moved to Pocatello. So I grew up mostly in Pocatello. So. My name is Mike, and I was born in a little town in southeast Idaho called Alameda. Do we know where that's at? It's no longer there. It was absorbed by Pocatello. <laughs> there was a street that went right down through the center of Alameda and Pocatello. And the mayor of Alameda sold us to Pocatello. So I was born in 1947, which is really, really old. <laughs> I went to, uh, I was born in Pocatello. On the Pocatello side, not in Alameda, at a hospital, St. Anthony's. Uh, my dad had just came home from World War II, and uh, he was in Okinawa. He was not a member of the church. My mother was a member of the church, and she was not essentially very active, but she did participate. So. 18 months after I was born, I contracted a disease called polio. And <clears throat> my dad was investigating the church at the time. And our home teachers happened, the bishop happened to be one of our home teachers. And my mother called my dad at work. He only, wor he only worked half a block away from the house. So he came home and I had gone to the fetal position. I'm 18 months old and I just learned to walk and I'd gone to the fetal position. And my mom says something's wrong with him. And my dad says, call the, call the home teachers, get them over here and give him a blessing and we'll take him to the hospital. So I was given a blessing, and in that blessing I was promised that the disease would stop then, and that I would never know that, I, that the disease would not affect me the rest of my life. So they took me to the hospital. For 10 days after I was in the hospital, I was in isolation, I had a fever of 110, which is brain dead for 10 days. I came out of the hospital. That's when the polio virus was going through the United States. That was after Roosevelt, our president, had got polio. It was the second wave that it went through. A lot like our coronavirus today. Um, <clears throat> there were six kids in a two block area that got polio all at the same time. So when we got out, the state of Idaho was full of kids with polio. So you, there, and this is a lot of guesswork like it is today with the coronavirus. They didn't know what to do with all of us. So the Elks Hospital in Boise, Idaho, opened up a great big huge wing and all it was was children that had polio, okay? But you had to get on a waiting list to get into that hospital and the waiting list was almost two years out. The guy that my dad worked for, he knew a, a person over here who worked for this government and his daughter had died in the hospital 
and they trans he got them to transfer me to that hospital, which is the Elks Hospital in, in Boise. So I was in the Elks Hospital for rehabilitation for three years. And during that three years, my dad, who was working a job in a gas station, didn't have the money to come see me. So my family were just, my mother and my dad were just two people that I knew because I, I grew up essentially in a hospital. So a very well-known lady in Boise, Bella Morrison, was my nurse, although she was just a young lady then. <clears throat> and I got attached to her. So she wanted to adopt me and my folks said no. Now back to my parents. When my dad realized that the priesthood had stopped the disease, all I got was one short leg out of the deal. And with you and you, every time you have, as long as you have the fever, the disease is killing you. And it's a nervous system disease, so it attacks your nervous system. So all I got was one short leg out of the deal, which not too bad. And my dad had realized that the priesthood blessing had accomplished that. So he took the missionary lessons and joined the church. <clears throat> One of those incidents, before he was a member of the church, they were coming over, they'd made plans to come over and see me. And my dad had rebuilt the motor in a 41 Chevrolet, and he said we can make it over there and we can make it back, and they had X amount of dollars to do it with. And from Pocatello to Boise at that particular time was a nine hour trip. No interstate. No interstate. So you had to go through every little town all the way up here, up Highway 30. Okay, so they got here, visited with me for a day, got in the car. They spent the night, seen me the next morning, got in the car and was driving back. And when they got to Burley, they stopped to buy gas. And Dad put $2.50 in the car. And he had one dime left. Uh, he bought two dollars and fifty cents in the car and bought a sandwich that they split. And he had one dime left. And when they got home, before he left, they paid their tithing. And when he got home, that dime lasted them for two weeks. <clears throat> They had people in the ward that had brought them food. They had a lady across the street that said her freezer had went out and she gave them a bunch of meat. Back then, gardens were plentiful. Mom cooked her own bread. Anyway, at the end of that two weeks, still had to dime. So, <clears throat> he never ever did not pay his tithing again. And that's been a blessing in our lives right up to today. <clears throat> when I got home, I wasn't happy to be home because it wasn't the family that I knew. So my dad and my mom didn't actually know what to do with me. So my dad, my mom told my dad that she would take care of me and that he could help with the other kids. So I became mama's favorite boy, which this family uh, that I was thrown back into, I didn't know. So at about the age of nine, I started to feel unwelcome in church and in the family. So I'm on braces clear to here. I'm in braces clear to my chest on crutches, and I decided that I could live somewhere else so I ran away. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get very far. How many siblings do you have? I have three brothers, two brothers and one sister. Three brothers. And uh, all of them are deceased except for my youngest brother, which is my baby brother. He, I'm 16, 
I was gone before he was born. So, <clears throat> by the time I was a teenager, I no longer was functioning in the church and I was no longer functioning in the family. So I left, moved in with some other people. Now, the point of this is this, that if Satan gets into the back door and he worms his way into your life, some of those things that aren't very big become super big. And they just keep growing and growing and growing. And any time the saint can force you to move away from the family, he will. So my recommendation to all of the youth is to stay vigilant. Stay vigilant. Stay on your toes. Stay praying. Stay in touch with the Lord because it's a lot easier to be good the rest of your life and all your life than it is to be good part of your life and then be bad most of your life and then try and come back because Satan never lets go, okay? So after that, I got married when I was very, very young. I had three kids before I was 21. Uh, got divorced, moved away, joined a motorcycle club, and my life from there was nothing but drugs and bad things from there on out. I got in a major amount of trouble when I was in the club, which drove me back to Pocatello, where I met Vera. We worked, I was working a job, I was still on drugs really, really bad. I, we met where we worked. I was a truck driver, believe it or not. <laughs> And we fell in love with each other, got married. Vera is not an NLDS person. I'm not an active person at all. So we got together and eventually we set up house. And in between times, my mother had always followed me around. She knew where I was and what I was up to and what I was doing. And so she called the bishop in the area where we were living and told him that that's where my records should be sent. So myself and Vera were having, Vera was Catholic, raised Catholic, went to a Catholic school, uh, was not a participating Catholic, but most of her beliefs were based on the Catholic religion. And so we started talking about Bibles. And her Bible versus my Bible. And I said, she had a Catholic Bible. And I went to the neighbors and asked them if they had a James Bur King James Version of the Bible. So we started comparing Bibles. Scripture. Scriptures. You wouldn't believe the differences between the two. Vera started asking more and more questions. I wasn't real happy with her asking more and more questions because I knew if she found out the truth, I was going to have to go to church, and I don't want to go to church. Well, I'm going to back up. I'm going to back up. So we're living together, okay? And um, there was uh, some missionaries that were walking down the street, and he hollered at them and said, come on in, I'll get you some water. I was livid. I honestly grew up not really knowing why I hated missionary or Mormons, but I did. And so I got mad at him for bringing the missionaries into my house. And so he explained to me why he did that. His brother's on a mission, and he just felt that the, I, I'm sure the Spirit talked to him about the missionaries and, you know, nothing wrong with bringing them in your house and giving a drink of cold water. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Back up. You can continue now. <laughs> so by then, the home teachers, wonderful home teachers, had contacted us and walked up on a porch, knocked on the door, and Vera <laughs> answered the door. And she says, what do you want? Go ahead, tell them. 
I actually threw him off my porch. I said, I don't want you guys here. Don't ever come back. Goodbye. Can you tell how a horrible person I was? It was terrible. <laughs> it was. I really regret some of that now, but um, I didn't understand Mormons. I didn't know anything about Mormons. And when I found out he was a Mormon, it was like, oh my gosh, should I throw him out? He's a Mormon. <laughs> I didn't throw you out, but... So the home teachers had told her, which I wasn't in the house at the time, had told her if she needed anything, they would be back, and she says, all right, you can come back, but don't ever discuss church. So for a long time, they would just come and visit, see how she was and how things were going, okay? In the meantime, and the rest of the story is... I got in a major amount of trouble and with drugs and dealers and decided it was time for me to quit. So I went home to her and she had no idea how bad I really was. And I got all the drugs from the house and set them all here and I went, this is how bad it is. And she was astounded. Anyway, I decided to quit. So here I am for 18 months laying on the floor, going through withdrawals, no ability to do anything. It was pretty hard just to take care of myself, which I didn't do a very good job. She was working. She would come home. We had a son, her son, and we would she would take care of him and take him to a babysitter and then she would take care of the baby that was laying on the floor, which was me, and then she'd go back to work. So eventually I got off of drugs. And hadn't, I hadn't worked for quite a while, so I didn't know how to get a job. There's a difference in working when you're loaded and a difference in working when you're straight. And I had no idea how to function in a world that was not stoners. So I called my mom. And my mom says, you need to talk to your dad. And I hadn't talked to my dad for a long time, years. And my dad got on the phone and I said, isn't there somewheres in the church that you can go and talk to somebody about? getting a job, and he says, yes. And I says, well, how do I do that? And he said, call your bishop and hung up. <laughs> so we asked the home teachers who the bishop was, and I called the bishop. And the bishop says, are you a member of the church? And, oh, yeah, I'm a member of the church. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was a deacon, yeah, I was a teacher, and I was a priest, and yeah, yeah, well, save me, and he says, well, he says, uh, are you married to that girl that you're living with, and I said, no, and he says, you need to come to my office for an interview, now, <clears throat> Before that, when I first decided to get off of drugs, I decided I needed more help than what I could ever get myself. So, because the home teachers had been there and visited, I decided the best thing I could do was get on my hands and knees and pray to the Lord for help. So for seven days, she'd go to work I'd go in and say the same prayer, word for word, because that's all I knew how to do, was start and finish, and I'd say the same things, ask for the same things for seven days, and then I would, after the prayer, then I would go to the front one and do whatever I did with going through withdrawals. <clears throat> so now back to, Bishop said you need to come to my office for a visit. So I put on my best smiling face, my blackest t-shirt, my blackest vest, my blackest boots, and went to see him, because that's all I owned. 
and I walked into his office. Very polite man, asked me to sit down, asked me my name. <clears throat> he says, I hear you're here for a job. And I went, oh yeah, I'm here for a job. And he says, there's a few things we need to talk about first. And he, re <clears throat> he answered every question in that prayer. In the order that I'd ask him, he answered him. <clears throat> and it was like Christ himself was standing in the corner. <clears throat> and it's really vivid to me. Now, I know he wasn't there, but it was like he was there. He had his arm forward. <clears throat> and he was staring at me. <clears throat> and the bishop answered all my questions. And it was like the Lord said, I've about had it with you. We've been here before. We've done this before. And this time is the last time. And <clears throat> the end of that conversation, this wonderful man pulled out $10, dropped it on his desk, and he says, you'll marry that girl, or you'll get out of her house. You're causing her to live in sin or you will see me again in court. <clears throat> Picked up the money and I went home. I knew she wasn't going to marry. She didn't like Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked in the house. She said, how'd it go? And I said, as well as could be expected, I got to move. <laughs> she says, what do you mean you got to move? And I remember I was laying on the bed, and I, I told her, I says, that bishop told me we had to get married, or I had to move, or we had to, <clears throat> or I would get excommunicated, and I'm not getting excommunicated. So I'll move. She wandered off, wandered through the house, came back, stuck her head around the corner, and she says, I'll marry you. <laughs> Shocked me to death. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> that same bishop married us. Uh, mm -hmm. We started having the missionaries come. Home ward missionaries, not the regular missionaries. We went through the lessons, and you want to tell them what you told them? Well, when they first started coming to give me the lessons, I, I told them, you know, I would do the lessons. Um, I do not want to talk tithing. I feel that the church has enough money and they're not going to need my money, so please. And so the, every month or week, whatever, they came over to the house to give me the lessons. And then one night, uh, they were late. Two hours late. And we're looking at each other like, did we get the time wrong or something? And so, okay, a couple hours later, here they come, and they said, oh, excuse us for being so late, and I, I actually didn't, wasn't listening to them, and I just blurted out, okay, tell me about this tithing stuff. And they were like, so shocked. And then they said, the reason they were late because that was the last lesson. They've taught me all of the other lessons, and so they rearranged the lessons. And they didn't know how to come in the house and explain that the only lesson is left is a tithing lesson. And they would, seriously were totally shocked. So after they gave me that lesson, um, they left the house and I went to my purse, pulled out my checkbook and wrote out a check. And I've done that ever since. Now I don't know if miracle, mm, I wouldn't call it that, but something inside me said that, yeah, God, yeah. 
Okay. We have not missed a tithing payment since that day. And we're here to tell you. <clears throat> doesn't matter how poor you are. doesn't matter what you have. Pay your tithing and you will get by. doesn't mean you're going to get rich. doesn't mean you're going to be famous. doesn't mean anything is going to change in your life. But you will get by. And after all, isn't that what tithing is for? Is to help us to get by and stay, and for the Lord to keep his promise to keep us safe and on the right path. And I'm here to tell you that the law of tithing is real and does work. We've had it so many instances in our lives where things could have went terribly wrong. And we've had the law of tithing kick in. A and blessing. literally, literally saved us mentally, physically, and in our lives. So I'm a firm believer in a lot of tithing, and I will tell anybody, anywhere, at any time, you don't even have to be a member of the church. Pay your tithing. So <clears throat> Vera decided to get baptized. <laughs> Which put me in a bad position because now I know I've got to go to church. <laughs> so we decided that we would attend church. So <clears throat> when we got married, the ward gave us a reception because we didn't know anybody. <laughs> the ward gave that us a reception. So and when we went, to, when we went to, the, to the reception, I'm wearing my best black leather jacket and <laughs> vest. <laughs> And when they met us at the door, they had written a song for us, treated us like they'd known us forever, had a cake for us, just literally invited us into their home and treated us like we absolutely belonged there, which was one of the greatest things in the world to us. So we decided we'd go to church. Now, when we first started going to church, I didn't own a suit and just went in my regular clothes, which was basically all black. <laughs> we attended church. We uh, advanced from there. We had some incidents in church that were not really good. <laughs> but we were always and always have been accepted. We smoked for a long time, even after we we started going to church, we smoked. Uh, nobody told us not to sit next to them. Nobody told us we couldn't go. Nobody told us we weren't welcome. They came and did their home teaching, kept us moving right along things kept advancing in our lives and there's another story about missionaries one day elder alvarez and elder lami lami elder lami had only been here for hours when he came to our house and he was sitting here and we'd been thinking about quitting smoking for a couple of weeks and i said elders isn't there a program in the church that helps you quit smoking and elder lami jumped right up and he said yes there is and I says Did you, can you get that for me he said I'll get it for you so that afternoon he brought it back to us now this man's only been on his mission for hours and he gave us the forms and we sit down read the forms forms were pretty simple you got to want to then you got to get all the things together to do it, and then you gotta have a talk with the Lord, and then you have to have a talk with the Lord, and then you have to have a talk with the Lord, and then you have to have a talk with the Lord. <laughs> so we did that. And within a week, we'd both quit. Now the reason for the no smoking is we ha actually got a visit from our uh, patriarch, uh, Brother Buckley, just off the cuff, he came to visit us, and Mike was having health problems, really bad health problems. Um, a lot of it was because of the smoking, probably most of it was, 
Anyway, he sat in the living room and he uh, told us he loved us. But then he said, I want you to know you guys got to go to the temple and get your work done. Now. Now. If you don't do it, it won't get done. Here or there. Yeah. And that scared the daylights out of me. I, I yeah, I was, immediately, I, I knew I had to do something, you know. I've, I've been riding the fence long enough, and... Yeah, I, I didn't want to be left out. I needed to, so the quitting the smoking was a top li on my list, I guess. One week, it took us one week, and we were done. We have been free of, al of alcohol, that <laughs> too, but tobacco for five years, six years now. Um, and alcohol for six years. Yeah. It's amazing and wonderful how the Lord works through other people. <clears throat> We'd been talking about quitting smoking for probably two months before Brother Buckley came. And Brother Buckley, when he came, he says, I am not here for the church. I'm here as your friend. And that's when he told us we needed to go to the temple. So that was our goal. Uh, we uh, immediately started doing the things that we needed to do. I went and seen the bishop and the stake president and people in Salt Lake and <laughs> to get everything worked out. And we went to the temple. And we have not regretted it. It's pretty bad when your son gets married and you have to sit outside the Oakland Temple and wait for him to come out because you can't go in. <laughs> it was horrible. They have beautiful temple grounds yeah. there, but yeah, it was. Beautiful. And then the blessing to that is our son got to help us go through the temple. Him and his wife, his lovely wife, helped us go through the temple. And that was a great, great day with all four and of us in that temple. And we also sealed him to us. Yeah, and then we had him sealed to us. So it's it's been great. So here we are today. Uh, wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Wouldn't want anything else to be in our lives. We're, we think that the ward that we live in is the greatest ward in the world. Oh, we really do. And it, it's... it's We've been in wards where, because of my past, and because of the way that I look, and other things that we weren't exactly accepted by everybody, we were accepted by a few, but not by everybody. And those few loved us enough to keep us to going. But when we got to this ward, that feeling had left. It was so much better at this ward. This is where the Lord wanted us. And this is the Lord that we this is the ward that we went through the temple with was this ward. So there you um, go. Throughout our journey to together, me and Mike, um, it, I hate to say this, okay, a miracle. I already mentioned a miracle with the tithing thing, but our lives were connected even before we met. And certain things have happened to us throughout our life together. And it was because the Lord knew that we needed to be together. And he put us together for this reason. You know, I, I don't want to say it's a miracle, but it really is a miracle. The, the things that happened. Um, I, didn't, I don't have any more to say about that. Vera's 10 years younger than me, and we lived in the same house at two different times. <laughs> yeah, go figure. Yeah. And we were both having problems with our significant others at the time, which brought us together, which I know that the Lord put us together, because with the other spouses that we had, we wouldn't have made it. Things wouldn't have changed. Then you get back to my physical problems. I had a major heart attack. 
and had a blessing that said that would be all right. And then I had three aneurysms in my aorta, and the doctor told me I had hours, if not minutes, to live. I had a wonderful blessing, and <laughs> that helped with that, and that's all straightened out. And then this last surgery I had, when I got there, I had a heart attack. The surgery went fine, and I had a heart attack three days in a row after that, three different days. So those blessings... <clears throat> have just been great and great and so many things in those blessings are so so sacred it's unbelievable the things that we've heard directly from the Lord do you have any more questions you didn't ask any questions <laughs> no, I don't know I, I pretty much told us everything um, how many kids do you have I want to know more about your uh, tattoo business <laughs> situation <laughs> and uh, if you could Lee, uh, finish with like bearing your testimony. I have three boys. Vera has one boy. Uh, when I was a lot younger and a lot more reckless, I lost the opportunity to even see my kids. So they were adopted by a man who raised them very well. I have 12 grandkids, two four great grandkids and our son that is sealed to us was Vera's son who taught me an immense amount about loving children, caring for children, raising children. The opportunity that I didn't get to raise my own, I got to raise him. He is one of the greatest human beings I know takes care of his family righteously and is a great influence on me to this day. My tattoo business is uh, it was out of uh, when you can't find a job anywhere else <laughs> you do what you I have always had a talent of drawing so <clears throat> My physical body got to the point to where I could not work anymore. So I told, I came home and I asked Vera if I could open up a tattoo shop. She said, no. <laughs> I'm such a mean person. <laughs> yeah. But eventually we agreed upon it and I opened up a tattoo shop. I had, before I retired, I had nine tattoo artists working for me, two piercers. I am covered from head to foot. Uh, all my tattoos tell a story. Uh, you can follow by looking at my body. You can follow my entire life, where I was, what I've done, who I've known. Uh, and I guess that's what my tattoo life is all about. When, when the when it fell apart, when the the economy fell apart. I retired and I've been working on an old car ever since. We uh, sold our motorcycle when Vera couldn't ride anymore because of her MS. And uh, I got tired of going by myself. So we decided that we would get a hobby to where we could build a car and she could go with me again. And that's why we sold the motorcycle and got into an old car. That's what we do now. Uh, when places to go on motorcycles. Yeah, when did you start riding motorcycles and how did that come about? When I was 12 years old, my uncle newly married, Gary married my aunt, so he became my uncle. And he had a 1947 Harley Davidson knucklehead. And she told him he had to give it up. I'm, I'm 12, and I went, I got to have that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I went to him, and I says, how much to buy? And he said, 150 bucks. Well, I had 75. 
So I gave him the 75 and he says, come back, you, I'll, I'll hold it, we'll put it in the garage. I'll hold it when you got the rest of the money and you come back. So it took me an entire summer to earn the rest of the money. So I took the money, and believe me, back then, you could ride a motorcycle in a 10, you could get a driver's license at 14. So <clears throat> I am 13. I went and paid him for this motorcycle, and he says, he gave me his leather jacket. I still have it hanging in the closet, my original first leather jacket. He says, here's the keys to it. It's out in the garage. I went out and opened up the door, and it was in every part of that motorcycle was a part. The <laughs> spokes were out of the rims. The pistons were out of the cylinders. The gears were out of the transmission. Handlebars were in the corner. The front end was over here. The, the whole thing was a part. He handed me a manual, and he says, when you get it put back together, you can ride it out of here. So, it made me so mad, I throwed the manual against the wall, walked out the door, and I called him everything but human. <laughs> For two weeks, I stewed and stewed and stewed, and finally I went, probably ought to go get that manual, see if I can get it put back together. Now, because I had polio, and in the school system, they had passed me along just because I was the crippled kid. I didn't know how to read. I had no idea how to read. So it was a matter of getting a manual, going through it, looking at the pictures, finding the parts, putting the parts together. And then I'd beat feet before he got home from work because I didn't want him to know that I was even doing anything. I'm sure he did, but I. I didn't want him to think I had been doing anything. And I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. Finally, I got to where he would come and sit in the garage and he would tell me what needed to go where and I'd find a part and put it in the bike and we finally got the motor in the frame and the handlebars back on it and the spokes back in the wheels and getting ready to set the transmission. The primary side was all on, went in to set the transmission in hooked it all up, got the linkage all squared away, was getting ready to put it in gear, and he says, what's this? And I turned around, and he had a gear in his hand. And I went, I don't know. <laughs> is that just laying on the floor or what? And he says, no, I think this is second gear. So. Off came the primary side, off ca out came the transmission, out came the top, I'll pull all the gears out. And believe it or not, second gear is in the bottom of the transmission, so all the rest of the gears had to come out before second gear could go in. That meant repinning everything. Re uh -huh. It was a mess. <laughs> Took me a week to take it apart and put it back together. Now, the short side of that story is, Thank heavens he did that, because I rode that motorcycle 140,000 miles over the course of the time that I owned it. And it broke down, it coughed and spit and sputtered. They weren't the best looking motorcycle on the road, and they only, it was a 61 inch motor, which was not a big motor. 60 was about the fastest you could go with it. So you're rolling down a highway and you blow a spark plug, and I mean when you blow a spark plug, come to clear out the side and go clear into the air, and you have to figure out how to get it, what was left in there out, how you were going to get it to the next service station if you didn't have a parse. And I had saddlebags on the back, and I probably could have built another motorcycle out of the saddlebags in the back. I had that many spare parts with me. But if he hadn't have made me take that apart and, or put it together after he took it apart, I wouldn't have known anything about it, and that probably would have been the end of my biking days, but it wasn't. That was the start of it. I bought my, I rode that one for 140,000 miles. I bought my next one brand new, 1965. I rode that for 98,000 miles on it. Bought a shovel head. We didn't put very many miles on that because I didn't like it. 
So we sold that for an outrageous amount of money because the guy wanted to collect it. We bought a 91. That's it there. There's a picture of it over there. We got 160,000 miles on the 91. We've been all over the United States. We spent every waking hour that we had on the back of it. Uh, we've been just about everywhere there is to go on the back of a motorcycle. Vera has 130,000 miles just sitting on the back. We have seen some of the most beautiful country in the world. It's nice to be out there. It's a whole lot different on a motorcycle than it is in a car. The smells, the wind, the rain, the, the road, the, the smell of the oil, the smell of, the smell of the trees when you go by them. You don't get that in a car. And when you run past a, a hay field that's just been mowed, it's wonderful. You go by and <laughs> s smell, smell the corn no, as it's yeah, growing. No, you can smell the corn the growing. slaps you in the face. Like yeah, you get behind a truck. And there is that. We came over the mountains uh, uh, coming out of Colorado, Rocky Mountain State Park. It was almost 80 degrees at the bottom when we started when we got to this top there was a snow we followed the snow plow over the top down into Esta and uh, that was one of the most beautiful rides we ever had well on the way home there was a tornado that had went through uh, the city just below the Esta uh, can't remember the name of the town. Anyway, when we left, the wind was still blowing 80 miles an hour, and we were in a crosswind. So here, and this before radial tires. Now this is when tires were flat. They they didn't have sidewalls on them that had tread on them. Okay, it was just tread on the bottom. So we come out of there, and we're in a crosswind. The wind's blowing over here. We're going down a highway, 385, the highway number. And I got the bike over like this. And okay. I'm back there, and I'm thinking we're sitting straight <coughs> up like this. The wind's blowing that hard against the tires that the bike's actually running like this. So we're running along. We're not making a good headway, but we we went from from 80 miles an hour standing up straight to 40 miles an hour wide open as fast as I could get it to go, leaning over. And Vera <laughs> decides that one leg hurts. So she's going to straighten that leg out. So she picks this leg up and steps down on that foot peg, which you can steer a bike from the back, believe me. That bike went from here to here. The wind caught us. We went to here. I jerked it back up to the center. We leaned over again. We got it running straight. By then I knew we were going down and I started easing off of it, got it stood back up straight and stopped. <laughs> what the heck are you doing? He yelled at me so bad. And I got off, my heart's going. <laughs> and I says, I don't know what you're doing, but don't you ever move again as long as you live. <laughs> she does. <laughs> so when we got on the interstate, Interstate 80 coming home, this trucker could see that we were fighting it, and we were over like this. So he pulled up alongside of me, and he looked in the mirror, and he just kind of shook his head, and that stood us up. He ran for 100 miles blocking, blocking the wind, the wind for us hmm. so oh, we could really get home. Yeah. Went down to Estes Park, which is in Colorado, back to Idaho, and had to change tires, wore them out, both of them. Wore, wore, the, wore the tires, tread clear off the tires. And that's only once. <laughs> All right. Testimony. Uh, <clears throat> would you like to bear your testimony? Um, Go ahead, and then I'll bear mine. I'd, it's really hard to bear your testimony, me. There's so many things that I truly, truly believe. I glad that I became a member of this church. I'm glad 
and that it's led by a prophet that can guide and direct us and actually guide and direct me on the things that I need to do which I fall back on so often but um, the blessings that I receive every day that the Lord helps me get through every day. Just so grateful for the things that I have. I'm grateful for a husband that has the priesthood that will be with me <clears throat> through thick and thin. Um, I'm actually also grateful for my work that I do uh, for ancestry and my my ancestors and all them Catholics are gonna thank me one of these days I hope when, when they know they have their work done um, I'm just so grateful for all that I have and all that the Lord has given me and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ Amen Amen. I too have a testimony that this gospel is true. My testimony comes from the opposite end of things. I know that there's bad and evil in this world. I have been there. I have done that. I have met Satan and his helpers. So therefore, I know for a fact God lives, and His Son lives. And the Savior, Jesus Christ, is our Savior. I know through the blessings that I've had that He knows me. <clears throat> and has forgiven me for the things that I have done. I know that. I know that the power of the priesthood is real. I am a testimony to the power of the priesthood in my life through the blessing that I've had. I know the power of the priesthood works. I know that <clears throat> anyone anyone in any situation that they feel like they're in can turn to the Lord for guidance and be guided. I know that for a fact. There is no way, and I say this because of Joseph Smith, there's no way I could ever ever in my life, my entire life, deny that this church is not true. I couldn't do it. I know too much about my life and what has happened in my life to even assume that I could deny it again. I'd go to my death before I would deny it again. <clears throat> I'm grateful for all the blessings we receive. I'm grateful for knowing that I'm here for a reason. I am grateful to be a member of this church, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.